Oh, the oyster passes time serving nature's grand design Without a second thought about his fate He consumes the briny blue, purifies it through and through Until he's plump enough to grace a dinner plate Oh, the oyster, he's the workman of the sea Turning estuary plankton into food for you and me There's nothing oyster than an oyster from the shell When your hunger he dispels or a malady he quells In low and high and shifting tide the oyster is our friend Until he meets his culinary end Oysters are really interesting animals. They start off life as a tiny microscopic plankton. Um, the larvae are soft-bodied, they're invertebrates, they don't have their shell yet, so they just kind of float around. They're so small, they're, they're plankton, they can't swim against water currents. They just get carried. And as they're dispersed, they find a spot that they like, they stick to it. Usually other oysters is their preferred area to settle. And then once they are mature enough to stick, they start to grow. Oysters are often referred to as a keystone species in the ecosystems where they live. And that is because they provide structure on a number of scales. They provide physical structure. They're shells. They um, attach to each other and they kind of stabilize the bottom. Um, and they provide habitat for all kinds of fish and worms and starfish and, and all kinds of animals and plants. I think it's fairly interesting that they're almost all born male and then over time they've mostly become female so they actually change sex over time or, or with growth um, which is kind of a unique thing. Oysters filter the water by creating currents with cilia on their gills and cilia are like little hairs and we have them in, in our cells and our lungs and, and so on but they're on the gills they move water through the shell and those water currents that are produced by the cilia on the gill also capture particles including the algae that they eat and little sand particles and everything they pretty much catch everything um, they sort at their mouth um, the stuff that they want to eat which they ingest and the stuff they don't want to eat which they spit out and contained in the algae that they eat, like, like any food, is uh, our nutrients, like nitrogen. Uh, it's a 16% of protein is nitrogen. Phosphate, all, our energy metabolism depends on phosphate. And so these uh, chemical elements in the algae are then incorporated into the oyster flesh, and that then becomes food for human beings, it becomes food for birds, it becomes food for crabs and starfish. And what's happening with the increase in coastal populations is that nitrogen load is, is increasing in our estuaries. So what shellfish do is they eat the excess algae that's produced by those nitrogen loads. This species is, is foundational, literally. It creates, again, space for, for everything from, from fish to worms uh, to plants, to aquatic plants, right? and to each other. Uh, they're really great at nitrogen fixation and new, other nutrient fixation that can come from agricultural runoff. Um, and nutrients like nitrogen in excess can cause bacterial growths, can cause algal growths in excess that could potentially harm other living things. So having an animal on mass that can help fix those nutrients, or and what I mean by that is to as they take it in, change it chemically in a way that fixes it into their body so it's not just floating around in the environment, they can help to mitigate some of the impacts of humans. So they've been eating oysters since the beginning of time. And the feasts in Rome and Greece are legendary where oysters were implied. Oysters were a very popular food item. They were in fact considered the original food cart, like today's hot dog. So people were consuming oysters as a part of their kind of daily, weekly meals. 
Oysters were a cheap source of protein, um, and they were sold on the street by fishmongers. They would be delivered to restaurants. They were frequently associated with drinking, beer halls, dancing girls, sawdust on the floor, that sort of thing. The whole New York area, New York to Boston, was um, awash in oysters a hundred years ago. They used to have oyster reefs. When the Dutch sailed in there in the, in the 1600s, they would run aground on these big reefs of oysters, and they were just growing wild. They weren't farmed. New York City was the mecca for oysters. We had oysters as big as dinner plates, and it was one of the most prolific sites for our oyster population in the region. So pollution paired with over-harvesting unfortunately meant that we weren't seeing wild oysters living, thriving in New York City's local waterways. Oyster harvests were declining because uh, they were being mined out of the local waters faster than they were replacing themselves. So it was a classic overfishing. As more people were populating the city, of course there was more and more waste, and there weren't wastewater treatment plants until the 80s. So you can imagine all of that waste going directly into our land and waterways. Unfortunately, that started to harm the health of these oysters. New York responded to this dilemma in 2014. The Billion Oyster Project was founded to restore New York's harbors through education and biodiversity initiatives. And the idea behind this project, behind Billion Oyster as well, with Pete Malinowski, is to create clean water for New York harbors so that New Yorkers can actually use the water. So way back when, they were the original food source, and now they're not here, so we're bringing them back, and we're hoping to bring a billion by 2035. Shellfish are one tool in a toolbox that starts with managing nutrients better on land and you know improving water treatment uh, at point sources and changing human behavior in terms of fertilizing lawns and things like that. So that's the most important thing. What shellfish like oysters are good for is the stuff that slips through those controls. They're never 100% effective and you, you can't address every source of, uh, of nutrients. It was about 10 years ago that the uh, US EPA certified nutrient bio extraction by shellfish aquaculture as a best management practice for water quality improvements in coastal waters. Over the past hundred years, the water on the shores of New York and Connecticut has changed. Fortunately, Connecticut's oyster industry is once again thriving. 25 years after it was almost decimated by a parasitic disease, The history of oysters in Connecticut is quite extensive. In the, it, their, their heyday was in the late 1800s and early 1900s. There were oysters growing here, you know, when the, when the Native Americans lived on the shores. They ate oysters, but they start, there started to be weather problems. The hurricane of 1938, that wiped out more oysters than any other event. Like we got oysters here in Norwalk, we're out here drifting in Norwalk now. The reason that's so important, a lot of it's got to do with the way the island, the chain of islands. Like if you're out here and you look, you look down this way, and you look right towards New York City, you can see the water just flows through here, so it gets a lot of current. So the water's coming around the island, it brings a lot of food, which is good for the oysters. Milford Harbor, because of its location, it's right between these two big uh, population industrial centers, um, New Haven and Bridgeport. The water currents from those two industrial centers never really got here. So things are better everywhere now, but Milford Harbor has maintained a, a good quality for, um, for nurturing living things like, like oysters. So where we're situated in Noah, Connecticut, we have we're right at the mouth of the Mystic River, so we get a lot of exchange from the sound and the river. Um, so we get uh, a lot of clean water exchange in and out, so we don't have stagnant water for very long. So we end up being based on a very clean, healthy water source. Growing up in the 70s, it was pretty dirty. You didn't see past your ankles. I mean, the water's really cleaned up a lot, and that's all really due to education. You know, the more people learn, the more people understand 
Because the trouble with oyster farming is you can't really see it. It's all underwater. People don't realize what's going on. The water is cleaner now than I think than it's ever been, unless you go back, you know, a couple hundred years. In July of 2021, Connecticut Governor Ned Lamont signed legislation to support Connecticut's shellfish industry in hopes of making it the Napa Valley of oyster farming. And further north, there's a special place where oysters thrive. Cape Cod, off the coast of Massachusetts, is blessed with serendipitous conditions that bring together the oyster and farmer to create magic. Oyster farming is about a $10 million business on Cape Cod. Anyone that lives on Cape Cod, anytime you're trying to explain Cape Cod, you're going to flex for everybody. And this is the basic shape of Cape Cod. You know, the aquifer running all the way down is constantly running off the land into the water. Oysters really like brackish water is what they really like. They like a little bit of fresh water in their salt water, and it just creates the perfect environment to grow oysters. I mean, it's not every place has that perfect water mix and nutrient mix to allow oysters to grow as well as they do here. When you live in a, a fragile coastal environment like we do here, you really see the impact of even small environmental changes. And I think that motivates us. A wonderful thing about being involved in the oyster industry on Cape Cod is that while I can control many things, I can control the shape of the oysters, I can control the cleanliness of the oysters, I can control the quality packing and quality insurance that our techniques guarantee. But what we can't do is control the flavor of the oyster. And we just happen to be living and working in an area that makes a wonderfully tasting product uh, with a long shelf life that the markets recognize and appreciate. We have the magic of Mother Nature, the Eastern Atlantic Oyster, synergizing with the beautiful Atlantic Ocean. And our honorable task is to um, make sure that the oysters that we select from our farm and bring to market um, represent sort of that, that magic. In Massachusetts, any town that has a shoreline with any type of shellfish resource has a shellfish constable. And that is kind of an interesting definition or name from someone who might not be from the coast, but it's generally a person in the community who has been uh, appointed responsible for that resource. Every town controls the shellfish in their town locally. It's not controlled at the state level. The state will permit certain activities and will have to approve certain activities but how the actual resource is developed, grown, the aquaculture, propagation efforts are all driven at the town level. The constable is in charge of overseeing the fishery for town-managed shellfish for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. A shellfish constable is also a policeman of sorts. You know, so we test, we have, we have area limits, we have a size limit, and then during the warm season, we have, we're under a very strict bacteria control program. The, the shellfish department and all shellfish constables are very much engaged in protecting what's there. We have to be um, on site at least two hours before low tide and shellfishing may begin one half hour before sunrise and it can continue until one half hour after sunset. And we also are in charge of overseeing a wild fishery, which is a unique, rare thing in the world. Uh, we have natural wild reproduction here in Wellfleet of oysters. In Massachusetts, the system's a little different. You know, we have a lot of smaller farms working smaller plots that tend to buy all of their seed from hatcheries and grow them in gear for the most part. So the way the hatchery works is we start out in the middle of winter, we bring in adult shellfish and we do what we call conditioning them, which is we put them in tanks and we feed them a nice blend of rich algae and we very slowly warm up the water to mimic the spring. And what this does is it causes them to 
come out of their hibernation, start feeding, start growing, and start producing gametes in their systems. So we basically mimic the tide rolling in over the sand flats on a real hot day in June, and that will cause them to release their sperm and eggs. Using a microscope and very fine mesh screens, we can capture the eggs, um, cross them as we like with sperm from healthy animals, and then we can, under the microscope again, watch them fertilize, watch the cells start to divide, and put them into uh, specialized tanks where they grow. You know, don't put all your eggs in one basket. If you're trying to produce anywhere from a couple hundred thousand to a couple million oysters or quahog seed, you know, and if, if one hatchery has a problem, then, then your whole season is shot. You know, we've come a long way, I think, in the genetics of oysters for farming. We try and breed for fast growth and disease resistance and also a nice looking oyster. Uh, we really like getting the ridges, we really like getting the black stripes in them. Wellfleet enjoys regular, predictable and significant natural oyster reproduction. So that makes us sort of an anomaly. So Wellfleet is a bit of a unique environment. They do have, you know, pretty prolific sets of oysters and you know, it's not to say that they don't happen in other areas, but Wellfleet's sort of been the most consistent. It may just be sort of the physical geography of our harbor um, combined with prevailing southwest wind in the summer that just sort of holds the set in. This red bag is filled with Wellfleet's finest oysters. These are hat seed oysters. So these are the spat collectors. You're sticking these puppies out around yeah, like right around the 4th of July. And you don't really see if you've caught any oyster seed typically to like, maybe like September, October. Then you'll start to see little teeny specks on here. And then eventually those specks really blow up that last month. And this is what you're catching. So you're catching this baby little oyster that's like a speck of sand and then it's gonna stick on these. It's a positive and a negative in Wellfleet because Wellfleet has this prolific oyster set. There's, for some reason, in Wellfleet, oysters love to spawn naturally and there's, they just love to stay in the harbor so that um, the larvae drifting around on the tides stays in Wellfleet. And it's wonderful because a lot of that larvae sets on rocks and shells down on the bottom and creates a wild natural population for people to harvest. It can also be a problem because if that set decides to set down on someone's farm, you wind up with, you know, your oysters covered with hundreds of thousands of juvenile oysters just growing on the shell, which, which is just a nightmare. You can't sell an oyster that's got, you know, 50 little oysters growing out the side of it. We have natural wild reproduction of oysters, and it is a blessing and something that is rare in the world, especially now when a lot of things have been overfished. We as a town over the years have had overfishing problems as well, but now as a department, we oversee and manage the fishery in a sustainable way to ensure that for decades to come and generations of young people, you'll be able to make a living here on the water. I think it's very enjoyable. There's a bunch of stuff to do more than just work and especially in the summer I love snorkeling in the river right next to our farm and going to swimming and building sand castles along with the working. I like to say uh, you know growing oysters you know it's, it's, a, it's a way of life more than just a job. You're connected to nature, you're connected to the environment. I think the most satisfying part of my job is being outside I mean, there are times, obviously, if it's blowing and snowing and stuff like that, it's not as much fun, but, you know, in the middle of July, everybody wants your job. I think you just have to be tenacious. You have to be willing to go out in terrible weather, go out on hot days, maybe some buggy days, just work hard, move a lot of gear, but the, the payoff in the end is great. In this industry, you have to wear a lot of hats. I'm a, a salesman, a farmer, I'm a weatherman, you know, you name it. Beautiful for one. I mean, I've seen, I can't tell you how many sunrises, sunsets, moonrise, moonset. I think oyster farming found me. You know, I didn't find oyster farming or aquaculture or anything, but living up here, it kind of just 
it just all came together for me. We're essentially making the desert bloom. This is a big sandy desert. We are synthesizing this food right here. Oyster farmers live by the tides, but their farming methods can differ even within the same region. A typical day is we show up and it depends on where the tide is. So in Cape Cod Bay at Crow's Pasture in Dennis, where we raise the oysters, we're doing what's called intertidal farming, which means that at high tide, the oysters are submerged in eight, 10 feet of water. At low tide, they're fully exposed on the sand flats. And um, what that allows for us to do is access those oysters in trucks. So a lot of commercial oyster farming would be done in a harbor or a bay. You'd only ever be able to get there with a boat and you'd be winching up oysters that were submerged 24 hours a day. Um, we have the opportunity here to really interact with our oysters throughout the growing process on a daily basis, which is pretty cool. Um, you get a real sense of what's going on at any given time. Yeah, we're on the uh, northern arm of Cape Cod, right, right here on the bicep. And uh, if you look, that's Barnstable in that direction. So tides are funny, you get really get to, you know, we live by the tide. So every day is different, but every tide is different too, depending on the state, you know, where the moon is and all that, and the waves and the, the direction of the wind. So we do have times when this, this place never goes dry. Over at Barnstable Harbor, we're working seven two acre sites. We're in the neighborhood of 5 million oysters a year. Depending on the time of the year, the, our oysters are going to 35, 40 different cities every week. It's a 52 week a year operation. We're a part of uh, a very important uh, fishery in the state of Massachusetts. My farm is three acres and it's in an intertidal zone here in Wellfleet, Massachusetts. And what really, I really love about my job is the fact that every day is so different from in the winter when we're trying to figure out if we're gonna be able to pull product off, if it's too cold or not, and how we're gonna get our product to market. To spring, we start pulling all our oysters out of our pits and putting everything back, ordering our seed, getting, receiving our babies. That ability, the throughput, to see it from a teeny baby seed to the moment when somebody's slurping it down on their vacation or their honeymoon or whatever it is, and to be able to be a steward of that and also to be able to garner the feedback, whether it's from mother nature, whether it's from the oyster itself or whether it's from that end user, um, I believe personally it gives me a really unique insight and an opportunity to um, know the difference between good and great, um, ready and not ready, um, and it, you know, it, at the end of the day, it engenders confidence in our, in our product. And it also um, means that when somebody asks me what makes these oysters so good, I have the opportunity to really tell them something real. Like that's a petite and that's a select. I don't know if this is precisely three inches or if that's, this might be three inches too, but this is a good oyster. It's round, deep cup. It's gonna be full of meat, nice hard shell. And this is a superb oyster. Again, nice round cup, flat top. I mean, that's just, that's, that's gonna be phenomenal. Because you're eating a raw product that's grown in, in, out in estuaries in a natural environment, and you're basically consuming what's in the water, um, the state and the federal government have set up a very foolproof system of tracing where shellfish come from. So every harvester, puts a tag on their shellfish of the date it was harvested, the time it was harvested, the body of water that was harvested. It's all broken down by letters and numbers based on the towns they're in and what estuary they're in. And its goal is ultimate traceability, back to the fishermen and back to the day. And you can ask your server to ask their buyer and it can just go all the way back and find out exactly where every single one came from. So they keep very close tabs on it and the constables and the health inspectors and the FDA do a really good job keeping track of where it's all going and where it comes from. It's a lot of work to get these oysters out and if you're ever eating them just know that it takes a lot of effort but it's definitely worth it. Every time you're getting an oyster depending on who grew it 
it's probably you know a small family where there's some children involved the mom the dad the grandmother it's also a family affair you know i've got kids um some of my coworkers are kids so it's a you know when we have a big effort like moving all this seed that we have in pitted right now when we're going to bag it all up and move it to the river um, that's like all hands on deck my father-in-law jim ward called us and said hey you know we're thinking about getting out of farming why don't you guys come and take over the farm and we just knew that an offer like that would never happen again to have a family farm where we could bring our boys so my my first job on the farm uh, i was probably seven or eight years old and I was running around picking up uh, moon snails, which are a, a predator for oysters and clams. And my, and my father would pay me a nickel a moon snail that I caught. My favorite part is probably when I finish helping my dad put a row of trays in. It's a very successful feeling. You know, there was a day when my great grandfather was out here with us and we had four generations working the farm together. And, um, you know, I think about that day a lot as a person who loves the ocean, as a person who has the opportunity to have a beautiful wife and wonderful children, um, to try to give them the best that I can and have it mean something. Um, when we all get together out here and, you know, the adults are doing some of the more strenuous tasks, as the tasks get more well suited for small hands or little movements, there's something for everybody out here to do for the work. You know, you can't freeze your life, <laughs> but there's a couple moments out here where if I could push the pause button for a second and really just soak it all in, um, that's it. That's it. So it's an honor and a blessing. People associate the flavor of wine with uh, a, a terroir, which describes the, the soil and the nutrients um, that give the, the grapes and ultimately the wine its flavor. So in oysters, it's called merroir because mer is the word for sea, whereas terre is for, um, for land in French. So in my view, yeah, it, it's sort of like terroir in a vineyard, you know what I mean? I mean, a wine guy will talk about the minerals and the soil and the breeze and, and, and that. So I would say, yeah, though, that, that as far as uh, for a flavor profile, um, that we have a, uh, a, almost an ideal situation. Every single oyster from Maine, from Nova Scotia, all the way down to um, Florida, it's the exact same oyster. It's uh, Crossosteria virginica. So the taste of oysters from one water body or one community to another are absolutely, uh, they taste different. There's not only a difference from town to town, there's actually a difference really from bay to bay, from harbor to harbor. They, they all taste like oysters, but some are saltier, some are sweeter, some have, um, you know, a little different, um, more fishy flavor. Uh, they are in fact different from different places. There's nothing that you can compare the flavor of an oyster to except the sea itself. I can't take any credit for the flavor of our oyster. All I can do is try and cultivate the shape, the size, and the freshness, and uh, Mother Nature does the rest. They're, yeah, they're just like crisp and briny. Sweet, salty clean, earthy, mushroomy. They don't have a real like blunt taste to them. A sweet vegetal note while maintaining a lot of salinity. But with a very distinctive sweet finish. You know, some people may like a salty oyster. I'm sure people are. But we like sweet oysters and that's what we produce. How do I like my oysters? In the water, not on my plate. All different areas will taste a little bit different, but every oyster farmer you talk to has the best oyster in the world. So the Wellfleet oyster is probably the greatest tasting oyster in the world. Shamelessly think our oysters are the best. Mystic oysters are the best oysters to eat, for sure. Buck Ops Island are the best. <laughs> <laughs> of course it's going to be one from one of our areas. Dennis are my favorite, for sure. We've got some of the best oysters in the world. And who could blame them? You know, they put a lot of love and effort into that oyster. And they probably are the best oyster in the world to somebody out there. Oysters clean the ocean as they, um, as they grow. So there's a synergy there that's kind of magic where something that tastes so good, that feels so good to eat, that provides a family an opportunity to make a living also um, improves the quality of the ocean. 
My hopes for Falmouth and, and really for all of Cape Cod and the Eastern Seashore is that, you know, as we start to address and deal with nitrogen, not only through sewering, but other alternatives as well, that we really start to see some of these estuaries and rookeries return. It's the ultimate in sustainable seafood. By growing a lot of oysters and shellfish and then removing them from the system and selling them, we have just cleaning the, the water, you know, a lot, and a lot of good things become of it. But without the consumer, and without this wonderful brand identity that Wellfleet in particular, and Cape Cod in general, is that it would all be for nothing. The takeaway is eat oysters. <laughs> That's the bottom line. Eat them, love them. You know, we see people eating them in 4th of July weekends. They try one, they like it, they think it's neat. You can do that all year round. And oysters are actually best in the fall and winter. They fatten up for the cold water coming ahead. They get more sweet, more succulent, richer. Um, make it a Thanksgiving tradition. Make it a Christmas tradition. Make it uh, a New Year's tradition. Whatever your family get together time is, include oysters. Cook them, fry them, grill them, roast them. You don't just have to eat them raw. They're, they're magic, they're delicious. And once you get a taste for them, once you get a love for them, um, they're a way that you can bring people together. Um, there's nothing like somebody sitting down and having their first oyster on a Friday night. And by Sunday afternoon, they ate three dozen and they're telling anybody who will listen, I love oysters, I'm into it. Eat them. How do you think the shoot's going so far? It's, you know what? We are in the game. person editing this footage. Check out this sunset. A hinge shucker, they would they go in. See, I'm not a hinge shucker, so I don't. Know. They go in the back here, and they give it a twist. They get it in and then run it across and pop it open. See, I made a mess of that because that's not that's not what I normally do. So this is how you do a side chuck. You got the you got the point away from you, the hinge away. The rounded side is down in the palm of your hand, about a third of the way down. You get your knife in and it's go right across the top, pull it up. And there you be. You open your oysters and you lay them on a baking sheet. If you want to get fancy, you can put rock salt. And then you take a stick of butter that you've had on the counter and it's softened. And you take a big squeeze of anchovy paste on that butter. And then you take parsley and you slightly cut it with scissors really fine. And then you mush it up really good. The butter, the parsley, and the anchovy. Put a little dollop on each one and a little piece of bacon on top of that. And then you put it under the broiler till the bacon gets crispy. And they're delicious. So I came up with a recipe called Lazy Oysters. Um, it's kind of an homage to uh, like the Lazy Lobster where somebody does the hard work for you. So my move is this. You take, um, you take your oysters, take a half sheet tray, put like a cookie, um, like a rack on it. 
and lay out the oysters. So an oyster has a, a flat top and a cup on the bottom and you want to make sure the flat tops are up and the cups on the bottom so they kind of stay upright. Turn your oven up to 450 or 500. Put them on the top rack, seven to 10 minutes, hot, right? And while that's happening, get a little saucepan, put some butter in there, olive oil, herbs, lemon, pepper, spices, whatever you like, and just kind of let it gently simmer. You'll know the oysters are done when the majority of them, the tops have popped open. Um, take them out of the oven, let them cool for a moment, and just gently with your oyster knife, just pop those tops off. It couldn't be easier. Anybody can do it. Anybody can do it, right? And then separate the oyster from the bottom. Take a little teaspoon, take your little butter herb mix and gently ladle into each oyster, you know, two dozen, three dozen, whatever. And then pop them back in the oven for two minutes. Get them hot. You want them almost like the texture of a poached egg, right? Not overcooked. And um, bring them back out and just eat as many as you want. And you never had to shuck the thing and um, it couldn't be better. I take a leek from my garden and I slice it about a sixteenth of an inch thick and then I get a mandarin orange, slice it in the middle, take an eighth off the middle, peel the skin off, take each wedge, put a wedge on the oyster and a dollop of creme fraiche and red, black and white coarse ground fresh pepper. Lately I've been into cooking them. I take home the big ones and uh, I'd put like, uh, make like just some breadcrumbs and some butter on there, bake them in the oven, just baked oysters, or um, I make a great oyster stew, which is kind of like clam chowder, but just with oysters, so good. I just made some the other night, so good. I think oyster stew is pretty phenomenal um, product and it's very simple. You know, you, you do have to shuck the oysters and have, you know, the meat and the, the liquor from the oysters and then it's basically, you combine that with just a little bit of, of butter, maybe some some onions, and then uh, I, I usually just sort of roughly half the the oysters and then half uh, milk. I like my oysters naked, just either you know fresh out of the water with nothing on them, or maybe just a, bit, a little splash of lemon. But you know, if you really want to taste an oyster, you want you know, to really taste it. You have to eat it naked and you have to chew it. This whole sliding it down your throat business is, uh, that's not the right way.